Welcome to teaching is like spaghetti and meatballs. So we're going to connect the concept of some of the concepts in menu writing and in to teaching strategies. So my name is Robin Long. I am a former professional cooking teacher, and I now work as the provincial vocational education consultant at Proceed. For those of you that don't know, Proceed is the provincial organization of continuing education directors in English, and we exist to help uh, develop and train uh, teachers in adult general and vocational education. And we act as a consulting body for, for, for uh, the means for English language education. So let's get right into it because I'm also worried a little bit about time. Today is gonna be all about how we're gonna connect these concepts that we talk about in menu writing as a professional cook and teaching strategies that we deal with as teachers. So exploring how to approach, oh wait, hang on, sorry guys, I'm gonna open up my, my, my thing, okay. So we're gonna explore these through the lens of managing client expectations when we put a, a dish on a menu. When we as chefs decide, okay, we're gonna, I feel like making spaghetti and meatballs to put on my menu, um, how am I gonna go about in getting my client to buy that dish and, and what is the client expecting? And so we're gonna go through that concept and, and apply that to, to teaching, teaching strategies, okay? All right, so the goals for today. We wanna to recognize that teaching approaches are, are, it's a fluid concept and they're flexible, okay? They're not in the box things. We wanna think about changing our teaching habits as well. We want to do this by participating and developing a working example. And at the end of this, we wanna create ourselves a small little teaching strategies resource list because, and the issue with creating a, there's no one list of teaching strategies because it's all about this flexible and fluid approach to teaching strategies. And so the list, if you decided to create a list, it would be hundreds of words long and there's no real naming of them. You name them how you want. Some of them are a little bit more common than others, but we wanna start creating a little list of something that's meaningful to us, to help us in our course development. So today, how we're going to do this is we're going to watch this presentation, but there are also going to be some participatory elements to you. So I'm going to ask you to, to participate in those elements. We're also going to discover some online tech tools, and these tech tools are really going to go after soliciting opinions and collaborating with others. So for those of you that were in James's workshop right before, it's great because he introduced one of the one of the, the tools that we're going to be using today. And I know that the learn team uses the other one. So we're going to play with 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 those tools and see how we can use them in a collaborative environment. And it's me presenting a teaching strategy to you in a certain way. And at the end, we're going to create a scenario where we are going to augment a teaching strategy and you're going to create a resource tool for yourself that you'll be able to use. So from this workshop, you are gonna get sort of a different perspective on how we choose to present our teaching material. We're gonna also think about experiencing our uh, uh, playing with tech tools in a learning situation. And we're gonna start at the beginning of a list and teaching strategies. The idea of a different perspective is we're gonna, it's, it's, we're gonna give ourselves, like there's only so much you can do in a, in a one hour presentation presentation and there's going to be a lot of complex ideas but we want to give ourselves food for thought about how we take into consideration some of the different factors that influence how someone will learn material so and we want to approach it sort of from a, like a design interface which is where the menu strat menu writing comes in because we're always thinking about the end user and in the case of, of a learner what we're thinking about that person, as well as the flexibility of the learning environment. So that's why it's a different perspective on, on how we're going, on, on how you choose learning strategies, uh, teach, teaching your learning strategies. Thank you. Okay, before we start, some of the tech tools that we're going to use. So today uh, we're using Google Slides. We're going to be using the Zoom chat. So at, uh, at any point, if you have questions or comments, drop them in the Zoom chat. Mark is my uh, chat jockey, so he's gonna help me out with that. 
uh, we're going to be using Padlet, Miro, and Google Forms at the end. So most of these you should be familiar with, but if you're not and you have some questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. Um, if you need help, because this is a conference and it's a lot easier when we're in person, but because this is a conference, go ahead and drop any comment or question you have in the chat. If we can help you, we will. If you're having problems with the tech at some point, like we can't stop the whole presentation <laughs> to be able to fix the tech problems, but just know the session is being recorded. And so you can act, you can refer back to it. And of course, as, as uh, the, the, the proceed, Provincial Vocational Education Consultant, you can always contact me and I can give you a hand with any part of this presentation. Okay, so with that, any questions or comments before we start? Okay. All right, so I think we're good. Right on, Leprechaun, let's get started. So what is menu writing? Okay. Well, oh, I got to move my little what I'm thing over here. So menu writing is about the concept of how you are going to present a dish to a client. Right. We all go to restaurants. We've all interacted with the menu. But from a cook's perspective, or the person writing the menu, whether it's the cook or the chef, it really doesn't matter. There's a lot of factors that come into play when you decide how you want to present a dish to a client. So if we go back to our spaghetti and meatballs, well, there's a lot of things that are going to go after, well, how exactly am I going to write spaghetti and meatballs on my menu to entice a client to, to, to buy it? One of the first things that, that we have to take into consideration is the restaurant environment, the theme. Is there a theme or a style to the restaurant? We have to talk about ingredient availability. What if my spaghetti and meatballs, I can't get spaghetti. Well, there's no point in me putting it on the menu. I can't make it. So we have to talk about, we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep in mind the skill of the cook or the equipment that's available. If I decide to do, uh, well, not in this case, not spaghetti and meatballs, but let's say I want to offer French fries on my menu, but I don't have a deep fryer. Well, I, it's kind of silly for me to put that on the menu. I have to think about the client's budget. I have to think about the type, the time of day. So is this a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner menu? If I want to offer spaghetti and meatballs and I offer it for breakfast, I'm not sure I'm going to have many takers, but if I offer it for dinner, I might have more, okay? Uh, client's budget. We have to talk a little bit about culinary culture. If I am in a situation where what I want to offer is very unfamiliar to my typical client, even though it tastes delicious, they might not buy into it. I also have to think about the client's needs. Are there specific needs that they have that I have to address in that? So if I'm a restaurant that is that offers a lot of gluten-free items, well then if I'm offering spaghetti and meatballs, I have to take that into consideration because my client might come to expect it. All this to say is what you're doing when you're writing a menu is you want that client to be enticed to order a dish and you want to meet their expectations. So when that dish comes to the table, you want them to say, oh yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. And now I trust that you're going to deliver on what you offer in the future. Because we all know that in the case of restaurants, if you're disappointed, usually don't say anything. You just don't come back. It's very rare that people actually say something. Okay. So what does that have to do with teaching strategy? Well, if we look at, at how I set that up, teaching strategies are how teachers present material to be learned to the student. So just like in menu writing, there's tons of factors that influence how we choose what teaching strategies uh, we're gonna use when we're planning our classes. So first and foremost, just like the restaurant, we have to think about our physical teaching environment. Our, am I in a lab or am I in a classroom? Uh, do I have access to uh, a large space? Is it a small space? Do I have the tools in there that I need? What's my physical space like? Okay. I have to think about administrative and social factors. Uh, the schedule. Is this a Monday morning class or is this a Friday afternoon class? I have to think about the group composition. Do I have five students in my class or do I have 25 students in my class? 
um, I have to think about the student's learning journey and their prior knowledge. So I have to think about where are they in the program? Are they at the beginning of the program or towards the end? What are they coming into with as, as knowledge about this subject? So in the case of cooking, uh, culinary culture is a huge thing. And so what culinary culture are they bringing with them? I have to think about the student's skill level. If I'm going to be introducing a concept uh, and I want to use a certain strategy, but the students don't have the skills yet to, to use that strategy, it's going to be a very difficult experience. I have to think about the materials available. So whether it's not it's my physical trade materials or whether it's teaching materials, I have to think about is that stuff really readily available and, and how are the students going to be able to interact with it. So just like in the restaurant, in the case of the restaurant and writing a menu, Ultimately, my, go my goal of choosing the teaching strategy is to guide the students' learning and then support them through any difficulties they might encounter. So what's the connection between these guys? Well, in both cases, you have to think about the parameters. You have to talk about, you have to keep the end users, uh, you have to keep the end user in mind. So in the case of a restaurant, it's the client they're the ones interacting with the spaghetti and meatballs dish. And in the case of the education environment, it's the student. They're the one interacting with the teaching strategy. So we have to take into consider the, the parameters. This will help us manage the client's expectations so they're not confused or disappointed in the case of the menu item. So I present to you the spaghetti and meatballs and the dish you get wasn't at all what you thought it was going to be. Well, you're going to be disappointed. And that we don't want because then you're not going to come back for more. So in teaching, choosing the appropriate strategy is so that the student case stays engaged and perseveres through the learning. If the teaching strategy I've chosen, I haven't thought about the parameters or isn't appropriate, I'm going to lose students along the way. They're going to struggle and I'm going to struggle as the teacher. The other thing, the other part of it is measurability, the feedback loop. So the menu item is not for me, it's for the client. And how I'm going to know that this is appropriate and that this, uh, the, the, the end user is having a good experience with it is that I sell the item, that when I go clear the table, the item is eaten and, <laughs> and the client says, wow, that was delicious. And ultimately that the client comes back and orders that menu item again. So same with teaching strategy, we have to think about the measurability of the teaching strategy that we're choosing and that feedback. So how am I going to know that what I've chosen is, is, is meeting the student's needs and is guiding them? Well, I'm going to pay attention to their feedback. So they are going to express satisfaction or they are going, you're going to see them persevere through what they have to learn. So you're going to, so, um, you're going to collect this feedback through these formative assessments. So whether or not you're using quizzes or tech tools or they're producing something, you're, you're, you're compiling that information. And of course, you're encouraging higher order thinking through self-assessments, right? So not only are you assessing them uh, through sort of traditional means, but you're also asking them, okay, now that you've produced this, I need you to think about it. And I need you to give me your opinion and tell me why you think that, you, uh, that, you will, that, that you've learned this and you've mastered this. So that feedback loop is crucial to uh, the user experience. So choosing a teaching strategy, just like you, when you choose how to write your menu item, it's all about adaptation. It's about the user's experience and not the content, okay? Spaghetti and meatballs, delicious. But if my user has unexpected, has, has needs that are not met and the expectation of what they received isn't there, then it doesn't matter that my spaghetti and meatballs are delicious. It's not working. So the clients, it's about the client's expectation of the dish itself and not the dish, uh, the dish, not the dish itself. Same with, it's about the student's expectation of how they're gonna master this content, not the actual content. Okay. 
So a small word on the influence of the digital world, because here we are in a, in a conference, we're all staring at a computer screen. Uh, we are encouraged to use uh, technology to enhance our students' learning. The key point about technology is that technology has to be engaging, flexible, and accessible. So do teaching strategies. So just like, just like in the case of I'm choosing a teaching strategy and I have to make sure my students can access that strategy, it keeps their engagement, and it, it's flexible to their needs, you have to think about the technology that you're going to be choosing for that as well. So I realize some of those are big topics and I'm kind of glancing over them, but I really want us to talk about a concrete example and then I want us to uh, make one, okay? So let's go to our concrete example of spaghetti and meatballs. So in the case of spaghetti and meatballs, if I show you a menu like this, you're looking at the menu, you're the client and you're like, okay, I see a nice little graphic menu. It's pretty simple, few items on there, not too expensive. I can see that I'm getting spaghetti. And I have my choice of just plain old spaghetti. I can add some cheese or I can add some meatball. Cost me maximum 15 bucks, right? So the perception I have with this is going to be, you know what, what kind of a restaurant is this going to be? Well, it's probably going to be takeout. We saw the little takeout number at the bottom. It's going to be quick. This is not something I'm gonna sit down for. This is something that I'm gonna be able to eat on the run. It's gonna meet my needs, but these are my basic needs. So this is kind of what I'm expecting to get, right? This is, when I see that menu, this is sort of, if this showed up, I'd be like, yeah, that's about right. Now, what if I see a menu like this? Already the look of the menu is going to change my perception of what that dish is going to be because I have a national flag, there's the, uh, the name of the restaurant all of a sudden appears, the one before didn't have a name of a restaurant, this one does. If I look closely at my offer, I can see that, well, all of a sudden it costs a lot more. Um, it's also got uh, an Italian name to it. So we're like, oh, wait a minute. So there's an ethnic element to this here. A little bit more descriptive as to what exactly the menu offering is. So now my perception of what's going to be offered is going to be a little bit different. Maybe I'm expecting something more like this. I'm expecting to have maybe a tablecloth. I'm going to expect a little bit more refined as a presentation. Um, I'm going to expect to sit down at a table. I don't, I'm not going to be taking this out. So you can see that all of a sudden, just because the way it was written, it changes my perception. Okay. Now I get something like this. I'm sitting in a restaurant and this is what I see. Now, right away, looking at the menu, there's no name of a restaurant. There's a symbol, it's very formal looking. And if I look closely at my menu offering, there's a whole bunch of words here that I don't even know what they are. There's some culinary, there's some, some, some uh, culinary words that I'm not sure what they mean. And it's 38 bucks. So that's a whole different ballgame because I think when if I see this, well, that's a very specific client that's being targeted, somebody that has a lot of culinary culture, and I'm looking at more of something like this. So all three of these things are spaghetti and meatballs, but because of the way I've written the menu and presented the menu, the design behind it, the, my perception of what I'm going to be getting is different. So let's go ahead and think about a teaching example. We're gonna start with the common one that we all use, <laughs> that I'm using right now, <laughs> and that's the lecture, the magistral lecture. I'm standing there and I'm in front of my students and I am talking, all right? So we all recognize this as a teaching strategy. All right, so what if I go ahead and add another teaching strategy? I'm gonna add the idea of a presentation. Now you're saying, well, yeah, everybody does that. They do, but let's, let, let's think about it a little bit. If I add to my lecture presentation, just like I'm doing right here, there's a visual support to the learning. Okay, so 
in the case of the lecture, all the student is, all I'm doing as a teacher is talking and all the student is doing is listening. In the case of a presentation, I've now changed it up a little bit. The teacher is talking and providing visual support and the student is listening and watching. So now we have two verbs that we're dealing with. Now let's say my presentation, I go and ahead and add some image, some graphics and some video. Okay, the student really isn't doing anything different. I'm not meeting any more needs, but I'm diversified. So, so, so that's a good teaching strategy to combine. Now let's say I'm gonna add some integrated discussion questions. So at certain points in the presentation, I'm gonna add a slide and I'm gonna say, oh, we're talking about menu writing and I want you to brainstorm. Uh, I'm gonna ask you the question about what you think uh, some of the client's needs might be. And I might add that slide before I show them the slide on well, what our client's needs. So by adding integrating discussion questions, now I'm changing this from the student being just passive to there's an active element. The student is gonna to have to reflect and contribute. So now the student's doing three different things. What if I add in a low stakes quiz at some point? So for those of you in James's presentation before, we saw a couple of cool tech tools where we could do that, where we could integrate that into the presentation. But there's also the quick and dirty, take out a piece of paper, write down these three things and answer them, okay? So it's not necessarily about the tech, but the idea that a low stakes quiz you're gonna bring into, the, into a lecture so that students can, use short-term memory to go over maybe some of the material that you just went over in the, in, in the earlier slides and to create a memory jogger for themselves as they're going through the presentation and as they're going through the learning. So at the end, there's some actual physical traceability to what they're learning. So now the student is listening, watching, reflecting, participating, and also remembering. Now, what if I go ahead and take that lecture with the presentation, with the integrated discussion questions and the low stakes quiz and create a, create a presentation that is editable. And there's some fill in the blanks parts where instead of just presenting and then offering it as a digital form of a book, I'm actually gonna ask the students to go into the presentation and on specific slides, fill in some blanks, go find a resource on the internet, give an opinion about that integrated discussion question. Now I'm going from the students watching, listening, self-reflecting, participating, remembering to creating and contributing. Okay. What if I had an exit ticket to this so that I can now, as a teacher, continue that feedback loop and figure out which parts of the, which parts of the, the lesson, which parts of that teaching strategy targeted their, uh, which part of the lecture were, were clear to the student and which part wasn't, which part was a little bit muddy? Where do I need to modify my teaching strategy? Where do I need to be flexible? Where do I need to adapt? Now, what if I added recording to this? What if I recorded this lesson and made this lesson available before the lecture or afterwards? Now I'm opening up another aspect of flexibility where the student, especially the students that have some difficulty with the learning, can listen to the material ahead of time to prepare themselves for class, or students that weren't able to follow along during the lecture, they can access it afterwards. Oops. And then what, what if I, as a sort of a side note, at some point, I can think about pre-assessment, where in that presentation, I can start with, well, what do you guys know about this subject? 
and I can do a brain dump to see where my students are. Because if they have, if they're bringing to the table something that they already know, if I'm bringing to the table something that they already know, then it's easy for me at the beginning, if I can see that many students are familiar with, to skip that or to, to, to change it up and maybe adapt using a different teaching strategy. So as you can see, these are all just different teaching strategies that you can kind of put together. So we're going to try that. But before we, we've, now we're going to go into the participatory part. Before we do that, do we have any comments or questions? Okay, I'm going to get out of full screen mode and I don't see any, I don't see any chat questions. Okay, right on. So what we're going to do now is we are going to try it where we're going to augment a teaching strategy. To do this, we are going to use two different uh, tech tools. We're, and we're going to do two different activities. So the activity one is where we're going to list teaching strategies and you're going to give your opinion on the strategies. We're going to use Padlet to do that. Activity number two is we're going to augment teaching strategies using other teaching strategies. So that building upon. Okay. So activity number one. I'm now going to drop the link to the Padlet. Where's that Padlet link? Yeah, question? It's done. Yeah. Oh my God, thank you so much. Okay. All right, so the link to the Padlet. So go ahead and click on that link. So for those of you that uh, are familiar with Padlet, where's my Padlet? Oh, there it is. I have to get my little thing. Okay, so this is a Padlet, okay? And a Padlet is, it's a, it's a great tool to use as a brainstorming uh, tool because it does more than just list words. You can also integrate opinions and concepts. So what I'm gonna have you do at this point is I want everybody to, to, to join the Padlet and you're gonna look at, at a, these list of teaching strategies and it's not a comprehensive list because at some point I was doing research and I think I might have 150 to 200 teaching strategies in an Excel document. So this really just is some of the ones I pulled out that are common in VOC. Go ahead and read them. And if it's one that you like, one that you've read, go ahead and click on the thumbs up button, okay? To upvote it. If it's one that you've used and you're not so keen on it, you didn't like it that much, then go ahead and hit the thumbs down button. And then if you want, drop in a little comment about it, okay? Where you can say whatever you want, uh, too much uh, fighting, you know, in the case of debate, all right? And then you can add a comment and then people can see that on this one, oops, there's a, there's a, there's a comment available, okay? And as we do this, we'll be able to see it. And unfortunately, I don't think it updates in real time, which is kind of too bad, <laughs> but anyway, you can see, you have to reload the page, but you can see, so there are some strategies here that are pretty common in vocational education. So, you know, student presentation is one we use a lot. Uh, authentic situation is another one that we use all the time, uh, using self-assessments. Peer teaching, we don't use as much as we should because it's a really effective tool. Um, student projects, we use a lot. Okay. Now, there might be some that, that you use that you would like to share with other people. And if you'd like to do that, at the bottom right here, you see a little plus sign. You can go ahead and click on that plus sign. Oops, hang on, my little Zoom screen's in the way. You can click on that plus sign and you can add one that you like to use. So it's not on here. Let's say you like to use, um, I don't know, think, pair, share, right? Which is a common one in the youth sector that we don't use as much. You just write that, you hit publish, and it'll appear. Okay, so let's take one more minute and go ahead and just keep reading some of these. And if you want to add some, go ahead and add what you think. The great thing about Padlet is that this can then be exported 
you can share, so you can use this pad, but you can use it like this where everybody's interacting with it. But then when you're done, if you click the share button, you can go ahead and save it as an image, save it as a PDF, save it as an Excel document, you can print it out. Okay, so it's really great. Uh, Fred, Robin, you got your hand up? I have a question. Yes. Uh, Robin, how do you move the, the little uh, windows because I, I'm clicking on some of them and I can't move them. How do you, you can't do this? Click and drag? I yeah, I tried and it didn't work. And it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, I can see somebody's moving something. You click on the, where the name is. Oh, where the name is. Okay, yeah, I'll click where it. the name is and then you should be able to move it around. Okay, thanks. Okay. So this one, just so you can see, uh, I exported it. And I exported it as an Excel, uh, Excel files or Google Sheets here, and you can see this is the way it appears. Okay, so this is a little, this is this is a handy function with a, with a Padlet. And just so you guys know, I will make these uh, available afterwards. So I'll take what we've done, and then I will. Oops, <laughs> I will. I guess my, <laughs> my controls are up here. I will take what we've done. And I'm going to, uh, and then I'll share it with you guys afterwards. Okay, so now we have some teaching and learning strategies to draw from. And the next part of the workshop, now what we're going to do is activity number two. We're now going to go into Miro and we're going to take some of those teaching strategies that, that are listed on that Padlet and we're going to try and develop a common teaching strategy and enhance it by adding these other elements to it. Okay, so, and this is where, okay, this is this was my tech issue from before. I didn't realize because I didn't have James's cool education account. It's a whole different ball game. So I am going to copy this. So uh, who is it? It's Mark. Mark, yeah, you don't have the right link. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, don't, don't click on that. <laughs> Just ignore me, ignore me. Okay. All right, so, because I learned something this morning <laughs> from James's Miro, uh, Miro presentation where I was like, oh, you have to create, uh, you have to have an education account in order to be, to be able to uh, share a Miro, which is a, a brainstorming software uh, and collaborative software. You have to have an education account in order to just be able to share the one page. Otherwise, I'm sharing my account. So that first link is the account. So if anybody wants to go see all the murals I've created and edit them, that's that first link. So it's the second link that we want. And it's a good chunk of information for us is if you're going to use Miro, get your, get your, uh, get your education account, okay? What I wanna do is I wanna take uh, two minutes as people are joining, I want to take two minutes to let you guys play around with Miro a little bit. It's no big deal, whatever we do on here, because we'll erase it and start again when we're ready to start our actual activity. But go ahead and play with the, the, uh, the controls to the left-hand side so you can see how they work, where, so that when we do start our activity, we're a little bit more familiar with the environment. So you can see there's text boxes here, there's sticky notes, there's shapes you can add, there's lines. There's also the actual setup, the template that you can choose. So in this case, um, I'm using the mind mapping template, but it, you can, there's a bunch of different templates available. So go ahead and like I said, we're gonna take another minute to go ahead and, and play with those tools so that we get a little bit familiar with them. And then as a group, we're going to go ahead and, and try and, and augment one of our teaching strategies. And as people are doing that, are, are there any questions, any comments so far? Nope, my chat jockey, we're good. No questions or comments over here. I think it's a very okay. interesting way of looking at uh, creating things. Cool yeah, who's writing cool beans? That's my expression. <laughs> um, this is something I learned. I haven't used Miro that much, but a little bit. If you right click, you'll be able to move the entire image. I always keep 
that's clicking and screwing things up. But if you write, <laughs> you can turn it, you can move the whole image. It's just, it's a time saver for me. Yep. Oh, nice. Okay. So I mean the whole screen, not the image, the screen. Oh, uh, yeah, because that's another function. If you look at the bottom right of the Miro, you can see right now it's at 100%. But let's say our, our work gets really big, our, 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 our collaborative work, by, by clicking on the plus and minus, I can scroll, zoom in and out so I can see a bigger picture or a smaller element of whatever I'm doing. OK? OK, so now we've had time to play with the Miro a little bit. Let's go ahead and we are going to reset our Miro and we're going to start uh, as a group doing this. Now, how many people are we in? We're like 20. OK, well, that's not too bad. I mean, I was worried we'd be like really, <laughs> there'd be a lot of people in here. Um, we have two options. You guys, we can go ahead and work in the document together and add the elements yourself. Or if you don't want to do that, you can also drop them in the chat and either Mark or myself will go ahead and put them into the document. Okay, so there's two ways of doing this. So let's go ahead and reset this. We are going to use, so I'm going to go into the templates and I am going to choose the mind mapping software. I'm just going to use the plain old mind mapping software, okay? And what we're going to start with is the one that I would like to try and augment because it's one that's used a lot in vocational education is demos. Because it's very much the way uh, it would help if I could spell demonstration, huh? Demonstration. Um, it's very much the way trade, trade learning is transmitted in the real world somebody standing next to you and will show you how to use a piece of equipment, how to use a tool, a technique, a skill. And then you practice, you go back, ask for more clarification. And as you become more skilled, it becomes your job to do the same thing to somebody else. So as teachers, it is, as trade teachers, it is something that we use a lot and frequently. But I can stand there and give a demo, whether or not my demo lasts five minutes or 20 minutes, depending on what I'm going to be doing. But just like the lecture that we had before, the problem is, is that the student is doing one thing. They're watching and that's it. So what we want to try and do is we want to try and augment demonstration. So I'm now turning it over to you. And if you want to unmute yourself and say, like, go right ahead too. And so we're about 20 people in here. So just be mindful of that. But it's definitely something we can do. I'm going to do one example. But if some of you already have some ideas, go ahead and start writing. So my one example that I'd like to start with, uh, where's my text receipt? I did all this ahead of time. See that? I'm going to add problem solving, OK? And in my Miro here, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to type something in here. And I'm going to say the teaching strategy that I would like to introduce is problem solving. And I'm going to explain that a little bit, what I mean by problem solving. And I'm going to say, well, at specific points in my demo, I could stop illustrate a problem that could cause students difficulty. And then based on their previous knowledge, I can ask them what I should do. At this point in my demo, I'm making meatballs for my spaghetti and meatballs, and I'm showing you how to make the meatballs. At this point in my demo, I have my meat, I have all my ingredients, and I'm going to mix it together into the bowl. And I could say, students, I might encounter a problem here. The kitchen is really hot. And I could have a problem getting my meatball mixed to emulsify properly. This is a problem. So I would like you, students, to tell me what I could do to avoid that. If it's a little bit more complex, I can say, I need you to go look at this part in your textbook and find the answer to tell me what to do. So I can add that element of problem solving. Depending on what it is that I'm introducing the problem about, 
It also introduces the idea of civic mindedness and the principles of debate to the student. Because if I'm asking them to, to tell me what to do and justify their opinion, well, there's this idea of learning how to present, present your opinion without being argumentative. There's the idea of not talking over people. There's the idea of active listening and trying to see another person's point of view to be able to decide which is the course of action. So in this case, demo, if I augment it with problem solving, well then I'm adding another, a higher, a higher level of thinking to what the student is doing. They're not just watching, they're also contributing, they're reflecting, they're analyzing, and they're proposing solutions. Okay. All right. Do we have another one? Do we have somebody else that has a teaching strategy they'd like to propose for demo? Did I lose my demo here? Is that, is that underneath or? Uh, oops, what happened here? Oh, there's my tech buddy. How come, uh, is it frozen for you guys? Yep. Oh. Why it's is James? I don't know why it's frozen. Is James, James still there? He's hiding. James. Is he still there? I just came back. Yeah. I was in gather. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, man. I'm just all over the place. <laughs> oh, sorry to do this to you. It froze? Is, it froze. It's still totally yeah, it frozen. Yeah, it seems to have frozen. I was trying to fix it and I think I, I made it worse. <laughs> if I re hold on, I just, I don't know if it's refreshing on my end, if that's going to do anything, but. Oh, that uh, might help. Uh, yeah. Does this work? Can we work in here now? I think I can change. Oh, Mark. Mar it's, it's not frozen. Uh, uh, it's not Bobby, frozen for it's, you. It's working. It's working. Oh, there yeah. it goes. Okay. Okay. Right. It's just okay. laggy. It's really slow. It's really slow yeah. for oh. too many too many people in there. Yeah, that could oh, be uh, a yeah, factor. Uh, just that. The, yeah, no, it, it's uh, working. It's working. It's okay. been working okay. all the time. Okay. Just lagging. So you know what? Back to like the whole tech stuff. <laughs> Got to keep the tech in mind because. <laughs> This is great. This is fantastic software. But if I have too many people on, or if I everybody like, you have to think about the parameters of the tech as well. Okay. Okay, I can see people are adding some. That's awesome. Okay. Okay, so I can see people are adding some. Does anybody want to comment on what they're doing? What uh, what they're doing uh, on what they've added? Why they think it would be why it would be a good teaching strategy to augment a demonstration? I see nothing in the chat. I can go ahead, I'll add another one that I've done. I saw somebody added finding a mistake. Uh, I'm gonna add the concept of, oops, no, I'm not gonna do this one. I'm gonna do this one. I'm gonna add the concept of chunking. Okay. Oops. Let's erase this. So I, I'm gonna add the concept of Chunking and chunking is where I break the demonstration up into smaller, more manageable chunks so that the students can see the skills being applied in real time. They can go and do it themselves, and then they can come back and see another part of the skill that they have to learn. So this avoids sort of long periods of a lot of, infer a lot of steps that they have to keep in mind. In the principle of uh, user design, which is a, uh, 
a psychological approach to design, the user can keep anywhere from five to nine items in their brain at once. So if you're showing a student a demonstration and there are 18 steps in that demonstration, inevitably they're gonna, some of them are gonna fall by the wayside. So by chunking it up and showing parts of a demonstration, having the school students go and do the, the, that part and then come back and see the other parts of the demonstration, that's a really good teaching strategy to use in the case of a demonstration. Oh, there's some good ones in here. Okay, so nice. Does anybody want to talk a little bit about the ones that they've entered? Why they think they're good teaching strategies? Robin, can you repeat, please? Yeah, I just wanted to know if anybody saw, I see people are adding a lot of information, which is great. And I wanted to know if anybody wanted to comment on some of the teaching strategies that they're proposing, why they're choosing those strategies. Okay, uh, can I talk? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, I, I added case study and I linked it to your uh, problem solving. So in fact, what I had, the idea was that uh, you are trying to solve a problem. And then after students have thought about it, then you can come with some examples on, on uh, your case, your personal uh, uh, experience. And then you have different case studies maybe, and you expose them to students, you explain what they are and you give them the opportunity to, you know, go beyond the box, outside the box, mm -hmm. and then think different ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's what I thought yeah. I would do. Exactly, that's great. Real world examples yes. to illustrate the problem solving. So give them a case in real life. Um, in the cooking world, this one's easy for us when we teach students how to make hollandaise sauce. So I'm demonstrating hollandaise, the technique to make hollandaise sauce for students. And there is no two ways about it. All hollandaise does in life is break. That's, what it, that's why it exists. It exists to break, okay? And so I'm gonna tell the students this and they're gonna say, well, chef, you need to make sure you're controlling your temperature. You need to make sure your sabayon is done properly. You need to blah, blah, blah. Yes, these are all true. But I'm gonna tell you, even with all these true things that I'm teaching you and all these true things that you found, and the holidays is still gonna break. Case in point, when I used to work brunch shift, uh, we always had, backups of hollandaise mix ready to go to be mixed on the fly and I also kept a tool on hand to be able to fix it because hollandaise breaks and then you, so you can say this is a real world example and then you can bring back the idea of problem solving okay students what tools do you think I should keep on hand to be able to fix my broken hollandaise so you can keep going with that idea so absolutely yeah that's a really good idea Fred. Thanks, thank you very much. Does anyone else have, uh, have one that they added that they'd like to talk about? Okay. Okay, now I don't wanna put anybody on the spot. It was just like, so this I can now export as this, this mirror I can go ahead and export and I can share. And what I did was, uh, so I had done the exercise before and my mural that I did, I exported as a PDF right here. And this I will also share with you. So that's a cool feature with Miro because you can be working collaboratively in a document. Everybody can brainstorm, you can get the ideas, you can move them around so we could say, oh, yeah, exactly. This case study, this is going to go here because all this is linked together. You can add your little stickers that you want to add to, 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 you know, make it more visually appealing. I think I have some stickers over here. Oh, where are the little stickers? 
do, 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 my little stickers so I can be like, yes, I love this idea. This is a great idea, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then once I'm done with my, my, we're done working together, you can export this. And I exported it as a, the one I did as a PDF. And so this one, I will share with you along with the one that we just did along with this one to be able to, um, so that you can, you, can, you can see how you can kind of do that thought process uh, either on your own or with colleagues to try and give yourself different tools and augment your teaching strategies. So, oops, go away. Here we go. Let's go back to our little presentation. All right. Back right, to slideshow. Okay. That was a lot. I think I have like 10 minutes left, right? How am I doing for time? Eight minutes. Okay. That was a lot. So a quick recap about some of today's ideas. So teaching strategies can be combined amalgamated, enhanced, and molded. The idea that teaching strategies are flexible and fluid. It's not, this is a teaching strategy, this is the way to use it. No, it, they can be, they can, they're very, very flexible things. The idea that parameters are gonna influence enormously what teaching strategies you will choose. choose. It's not because it's in Bloom's taxonomy, it appears here, as far as tech tool integration, that you should be using it a lot of factors are going to influence how, why and how you choose the tools. We want to keep the learner actively engaged with the material through the teaching strategies. And we want to make sure that that feedback loop is happening, that measurability, so that that learner provides the information to the teacher about adapting their strategies. And then, of course, the idea that the vision of this is that the end user is the student and care must be taken to keep their interaction with the learning as the focal point. Just like how in a restaurant, the menu writing we do is not to showcase the chef's talents. The menu writing we do is to sell a dish to a client and meet their expectations. So in this case, it's about meeting the student's expectations and needs and not those of the content. Any questions or comments? Phew! Despite the tech problems. Fred. Uh, is Nero expensive or? I have no idea. Is James no. still there? I am, yeah. Miro, Miro, Miro is free. Uh, there is a difference between the the regular free version and the educational version, whereas anybody can sign up for the free version. Although with the free account, uh, all of the boards that you create are public versus private. And um, you cannot easily share and have people collaborate on the board like we were just collaborating on Robin's yeah. board. So uh, <laughs> it, the process to request an educational account is pretty straightforward, but you do need a proof of employment. And uh, sometimes their requirements are pretty stringent. So, uh, but if you need any help with that, you can reach out to me. I can help you out with that. No problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thanks, Fred. Any other comments, questions? No? Okay. I'm not pushing you guys forward. <laughs> if you have anything, go ahead and ask me in Gather Town afterwards. I just, I see it's getting close to lunchtime. Uh, before I sign off, there's uh, two things that I like to mention to you. So as the provincial education consultant, I have started a series called Voc Talk. And Voc Talk is, I do a bunch of things, but it's really to get discussions going around vocational training. The number one thing I do is I write a monthly newsletter that talks about subjects of interest that, that, that for tradespeople. I hold a twice weekly Voc Talk Cafe where you can, I, and I do these in centers, so you can come see me in a center, but then there's always an open online link, so you can come visit me online as well. And, and I've started some DIY workshops that are linked to this as well. Uh, where once a month I'm going to walk you through creating a tool that you could use for your teaching. And those tools are published, uh, the, the DIY workshops are published through the SEND network. If you are interested in finding out more about VokTalk, so you can always talk to me here at GatherTown, but you can also use the, the QR code or I will drop in the resources in this room, the link to the VokTalk website. 
And I can just show you the VokTalk website here. Oops. The VokTalk website right here. This is where I house the subscription to the newsletter. And I also have the past issues of VokTalk. So you can go ahead and take a look and be like, well, before I sign up for anything, I want to read this email thing, blah, blah, blah. You can look and see what the newsletter has. So those, that's one way that I'm trying to support the, uh, the, VOC, um, the VOC world. And so I encourage you to let, uh, for teachers to join up. And if you are part of an administration or, or professional staff, you can send that information to your teachers. And before we go, let me know how you enjoyed this workshop. Uh, you can uh, click here. Those of you that already have access to this presentation, you can click here to access the exit ticket. But I would ask Mark, would you please drop the exit ticket link in the chat at this point? So thank you very much. Yeah. And I will post the gather town, but you've probably seen it so many times that you're sick of it, but here it is again. If you wanna come back after lunch, uh, we're starting up again at 1 p.m. So exit ticket and everything. So thank you everyone for being here. Thanks for coming. Thanks Robin. Thanks Robin. Awesome Robin.